All right, here we are. Chapter 7, Episode 1. <sighs> social stratification. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about social stratification, how we rank society and different cultures rank themselves or the people in society. We're going to look at <clears throat> who are the rich, who are the poor, what are the gaps that exist, how can we make things more just and more equal. Certainly right now as we talk about unemployment, social stratification, job security, things like that, um, we're sort of <clears throat> in fairly unprecedented times. So let's take a look at this. Do you remember seeing, it's in that left corner there, that cartoon, Animal Farm? I mean, I know the book and most people read it, but did you ever see the really creepy 70s or early 80s cartoon? Whew, it's the stuff of nightmares. All animals are equal. So if you know the idea, that's that uh, the animals were getting treated really poorly by the humans. The humans were abusing the animals. They were destroying them. They were not giving them any rights. And what happened was the, the animals took over, right? They have a rebellion. They take over. The pigs put themselves in power. And at first, right, it's all animals are equal. And that's just the way it is. But later, once they start to really take on their regime and their power and abuse their power and access and privilege, then they, they add a little bit extra. And that is all animals are created equal or are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on with the metaphors in this book, but certainly it is a reflection of what we are still experiencing, not just what Orwell wrote a long, long, long time ago, but even now. Oh, wow. I love historical photos. Look at the size of those propellers. I mean, and I've never even been in a house that has a staircase like that, let alone a boat. I mean, to me, historical photos, I could look at them all day long, all the time. Pretty amazing. So let's look at some of the statistics uh, for the Titanic sinking. Women and children first. So 80% of the deaths on the Titanic were men. 60 of the first class tickets were saved. 36 of the second class survived. And only 24 of the third class, and certainly... Nobody that was part of the ship working itself, they were even trapped and locked down below. They weren't going to get off that boat. So another way to look at it, though, would be 40% of the first class passengers drowned, 64 of the second class, and 76% of the third class passengers drowned. And so really this is just a big reminder that social inequality affects the way people live. And not only that, but whether they live at all, and we'll go even further right, as we throw that line out into that water, um, how long you live. If you are a person of color and identify as a gender female, you might live in some areas and instances up to 10 years shorter than your counterpart of the same age uh, of European descent. Um, so it does impact whether people live at all and how they live, certainly each one of us. The same, uh, same is the same true today, of course, and we could look at many, many, many different ways, and we will. What are a person's odds of being born into poverty? D. Rose, I'm a Chicago fan all the way. Good to see Derek Rose. Um, but here we look at the percentage of children in 2011 in poverty. A white married couple has the lowest amount at 6.1. Then it jumps to 16 for an African-American married couple, jumps to 23 for a Hispanic married couple. Once we start getting into single mother um, hood, we know that those numbers are going to jump even more. White single mother, African-American single mother, and a Hispanic single mother. Um, so obviously your chances um, of being born into poverty are greater depending on your race, truly, and also how many people are at home, whether you're looking at a co-parenting situation where the people are married, or whether you're looking at a single parent, usually a mom. All right, time to answer that question, just like Monopoly the Game. Isn't it funny that Monopoly the Game, I always remember whoever was the banker stole money to sort of do better in the game, whoever had the money right by them. We talked about that in theory last chapter. I don't think much has changed these days. In general, the rich people in the world have justifiably earned their wealth. Do you strongly agree? Uncertain, moderately agree, strongly disagree. Think about that for yourself, opinion piece. Students that come from wealthy families earn their college placement with their own efforts and accomplishments, not their parents' money and influence. Again, same list. We're just looking at perceptions of wealth and people. And this is a really big, important one, too. Most people could get ahead in the United States if they really tried. Um, for years and years and years, it was agree mostly. Then it was sort of around the middle. Now we're finding last 
couple semesters that I've done this, um, maybe a couple years, more people are disagreeing, but you know, really that's sort of the American dream, right? I mean, if you answer this question, no, or you disagree, or that's simply not true, we have a lot of work to do in as far as how we take care of people, the promises that we get for justice and equality for all. Most people could really get out of the United States if they tried. Furthermore, you're here in this class for that very reason. So if you disagree and you're spending thousands of dollars, then we really need to look at those conditions to make sure that that is simply not the case for people who are trying to get in. All right, social stratification. What is it? A system by which a society ranks and categorizes people in a hierarchy. In every culture, every society tends to rank those people differently and for different reasons. Social stratification, another way to look at it would be the systematic ranking of different groups of people in a hierarchy of inequality. And that means that if you're ranking people in a hierarchy, it is going to be a hierarchy of inequality. Some people are going to be down here, some are going to be here, some are going to be here, although we want a very egalitarian approach to things. That is not the way systems um, work out, and they are purposely, in fact, stratification systems designed to benefit some people while purposely designed to um, take away or um, have negative impacts on others and specific others. So social inequality, what does that mean when we talk about inequality? Good test question. A disparity in income, wealth, power, prestige, and other resources. And income is one thing, but accumulated wealth is a very, very, very big piece, okay? And we know that white to African-American, I think is eight to one, white to Latino, I think is 11 to one, we have a great disparity in wealth. And that means how many generations have you actually been able to own a home? Have you been able to get a certain job? Have you been able to go to school based on your gender or your race or your age or whatever that might be? So inequality, a disparity in all of these things and certainly power and prestige and other resources, very important as well. All right, so we've got four basic principles. Um, again, Excellent test question. These are the four basic principles of stratification, so I really do want you to know them and understand them. One, it's a trait of society, not simply a reflection of individual differences. A lot of people sort of sell that notion that this is just how we're distant or different. It's sort of a natural reflection of that, um, but that is not true, right? I mean, think about the Titanic again. Do we think that only the good swimmers survived? No, where were they on the boat? Where were they on the ladder? Did they have to climb way up? Were they already on the top decks? I mean, we do think of stratification or social standing in terms of personal talent and effort, but we know a lot of that wealth is transmitted. A lot of those jobs are transmitted and not earned. So not everybody earns it, uses their talent and effort and ability to earn it. And also it's not just that people are innately, innately um, different and that somehow reflects it. We designed social stratification for a reason and very specifically, like I said. Social stratification carries over from generation to generation. Again, it is a trait of societies, not individuals. Great test question. Society knows, right, who they can pass it on to, who that wealth gets passed on to, how that looks, what that wealth look like, all of that, what kind of access your children have. Because if I were to ask, how many people got a job because of somebody they know, no matter what your race or gender or ability is, that's almost everybody at some point in life, right? All right, social mobility. Now, if we're gonna talk about stratification, the ability to rags to riches, all right, go get a lottery ticket, scratch it off, and then boom, you're rich. <laughs> all right, Dave Chappelle. Um, so what is mobility? A change in position within a social hierarchy. So let's say you have a ladder, Right, maybe Derek Rose, right? He was an example, I had a picture of him. He starts off down here. We're not saying that nobody can move. And if we look at our stratification uh, in the United States, certainly there's some room for mobility. Uh, Derek went from, I mean, dodging bullets, playing basketball on these courts that are really dangerous in Chicago um, to, you know, signing a $100 million shoe contract. So obviously his position and his parents' position then greatly, and his brothers, you know, and stuff, greatly changed. So uh, social mobility, and that's, we'll look at the degree to which people actually move. Three, social stratification is universal, but variable. What and how a system is unequal varies. Same with race. Look, race exists, and people are like, oh, it shouldn't matter, it doesn't matter. It does, and it matters 
how we put and what traits we say are important or not important and how we cement that in society. So I have one of the questions here, like it's variable. Do you think a company executive is worth more than an administrative assistant or a secretary or a cook or a server versus a manager? I mean, for my students that have served, a lot of them know that the servers and the cooks work really hard and a lot of their managers hide out in the back room on the phone um, and then come out once in a while. So not necessarily, right? What and how a system is unequal varies and is very purposeful. Four, social stratification involves not just inequality, but beliefs that it's well-defined is fair. Pull your bootstraps up, poor folks. If you were trying, you'd get there someday. Yeah, but we started the race a long time ago and you started the race right when they went go. Look, that's this idea here. Because to accept the levels of inequality that we have in our system, you need the system continuously redefining in ways that that's fair. Well, those people do the jobs that other people don't want to do because that's all they can do, right? Obviously, that doesn't always carry with it a lot of truth. So just to show you that I'm fair or at least neutral as I can be, do you believe that the Kennedys are deserving of all the money that they have, right? The kids, the children of, the next generation then? Um, or do you believe that George Bush deserved to go to Yale with a C or below average in high school? They have those spots for those families that give money and have power and prestige and wealth. And I imagine nobody in our class or that's watching this lecture right now got C's in high school and was straight fast track to Yale. Woo, yeah, baby, you're gonna sign your ticket. No, no, you're lucky. You're lucky if you're gonna get into a state university at times with a grade point average that would be like that. So and that's no hack on state schools. That's just to say not even Yale, right, has that fair element to it. So, of course, that's inequality, passing or transmitting wealth, and the idea that we call it fair or we find ways to justify it is so, when in reality, that's anything but true. All right, so let's look at that. Do you agree that our system of wealth distribution as not as is fair? Okay, yes, no. This is my dad's answer. Who said things would be fair, right? Or who said things would be this unequal? I mean, we kind of have an expectation that things in this country can't be institutionally and legally this unequal, Meh, right? So anyway, that's an individual question. What do you think about our wealth distribution? All right, since we're talking about it, let's look at wealth or net worth, something that a lot of us don't really have to worry about. What is our net worth? Uh, wealth, though, is everything, right? It's the value of everything you own minus everything you owed, which also makes a lot of very wealthy people not very wealthy, depending on debt, right? And that's one of the ways that we find people compromised. And especially when I was going to college, they were sending a new credit card, not an offer, a new credit card to everybody every week. And a lot of people don't have economic sort of money, financial counseling, and it's not transmitted from their parents, right? So they rack up a great deal of debt. And of course you go to school and you rack up tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand plus dollars in debt. What kind of job are you really gonna do when you feel sort of like you are bound through economic slavery? Anyway, that is an idea of wealth. What you own minus what is owed. So home equity, vehicles, stocks, bonds, cash, other forms of investment assets, and you build these up over a lifetime and you pass them down not just once, but over generations to your children. And they use those and they invest those and they get money and power and prestige from those in your name and what you did. And then they pass it on to create new opportunities for their children. Right? High quality education, business ventures, access to travel and leisure, financial security and creation of new wealth are just some things that already having wealth and transmitted a deal of wealth can bring to you or your family or that next generation. All right, um, here's what I was talking about. I think I said 11 to one before, but it's 12 to one. So here's our wealth gap. White to African-American, eight to one. White to Latino, 12 to one. I said built up over a lifetime and passed down from generation to generation to create new opportunities. What kind of new opportunities are you gonna have, right? Not the same opportunity, forget that. What kind of new opportunities are you gonna have when the wealth disparity, the gap, European to minority, right, is eight to one or 12 to one. If your family is on the receiving end of that, I imagine they are very upset by that because I can't, 
think or even imagine people in dominant culture not being completely irate if we found out that you weren't exactly one to one. If we found out that it was two to one, and people of European descent would definitely be freaking out. Um, and I think that justifiably so, when things are really, really, really unequal, right? That cognitive dissonance between what we say you can do and what you really can do and what the system keeps you doing, even though it says no glass ceiling, but we know that that's true for women and same is true across the board with minorities, um, then justifiably so people are upset. All right, how can we fix this? How can we make this better for people? How can we make our own culture more livable, less stratified and less of a huge gap? Talk about that next time, folks. Peace, be good people and do good things. Talk to you later.